that was a good story, changed my perspective. I was just curious to know, um, did, did you have an anxious attachment on the past? I would say I've primarily, primarily been disorganized um, in the past. Disorganized, fearful, avoidant. Um, so I am very familiar with the feeling of anxiety. Uh, but my primary, it's often been an internal experience. My external behaviors and expressions have been more avoidant in nature. But the internal landscape has been very anxious. Um, I believe I I believe I'm becoming increasingly secure, and the assessments I've been taking have said that I'm increasingly secure. So, <laughs> yay! I have another story that might be useful. So I um so I did after this experience with the my Mexican lover, which <laughs> I do have like really warm feelings about that whole experience. Still, um, I did. I said to myself, I'm not going to close up because it's definitely been my habit to have a wonderful experience. Something doesn't work. And then I sort of close up and I go back in and not that's as good or bad, but I think that has been a, an expansion and a contraction that I have gone on for a long time. Um, and I think I needed to go through that process because it's almost like the negotiation of boundaries, right? We talk about our boundaries being too expansive or too rigid. And I think because I had experienced um, disorganized attachment and fearful avoidance for a long time, I had to go through this process of swinging between both extremes in order to kind of eventually like map out the landscape, the internal landscape, and then how the external landscape relates to that once I've finished mapping it, or am, it's never finished, but once I'm in the process of mapping it out. And actually, this is probably an important thing to explain is that I don't view security, like I don't view secure attachment as being measurable by how well, by how well you necessarily do in a relationship, like how successful or how well or whatever, or how, how you fail or whatever. And even if you sustain a long-term relationship, I don't necessarily think that you're secure just because you're in a long relationship doesn't mean you're secure in that relationship, right? So then what is security? Felt security is an internal experience that we're talking about here. How you interact with other people becomes a manifestation of how much internal felt security you experience. And, and this is why I'm saying the stories that we are writing around these things are so crucial because that is what's going to affect the internal felt experience, right? And that is what felt security is. Now, to really explain that, I, I wanna talk about self this concept of self, that there's an internal dial monologue that we all have, right? There's a story that we have going on inside our heads and we have varying degrees of consciousness around how that story is playing itself out. And I think raising our sense of consciousness around our experiences is synonymous when it with, or can be synonymous with experiencing increased felt security because you become increasingly command in command of what that story is gonna be. And that is an exercising of free will right, as opposed to responding impulsively. Now, oftentimes people get that that far. They get that far and they have a tremendous amount of insight, right? But then the insight, then there's like, there's like a next step beyond insight and that is feeling differently. And the ego lets you get as far as insight and then it's like, hmm, but feeling differently, that's a whole other ball game because that means that we're really, really gonna have to dig deep and change some of the ways that we've been absorbing our experiences and our stimulus and then protecting or not protecting or pr think that we are protecting our greatest good. But it's an old story that has worn itself out. So, so then what happens is we have to not just have the insight, but we have to allow the body to have its own language. And that is why I say we have to be able to get in touch with the spiritual aspects, which again is what I'm defining as what life means to you and or how you are going to make meaning of your experiences, right? And, and that means that you have to let the body speak to you. You have to kind of surrender to the idea that there are aspects of yourself that are unknowable to you on a conscious level and always will be. But when we talk about security, what we're talking about is being able to practice a process. It's a process of imagine you've got, um, you know, you've got a bunch of people in the attic and the light is off and you go up into the attic and you turn on a flashlight and you shine it around the room. And as you shine it around the room, certain faces become visible to you because you're shining the light on them. But 
you've still got all these other people that are obscured in the shadows, right? And I would have you imagine that these figures in the attic are your self parts. They're energetic constellations of things that occurred to you throughout your lifetime and who knows, maybe beyond that. And they are all existing in this sort of Mm, semi-permeable bubble of energy that is you. And your body is in fact just the most concentrated part of that bubble. And your body is sort of like the flashlight. And all of the physical experiences that you have are a way of honing your focus and intention like a beam of light coming from a flashlight so that you might be able to look at and consider and enact certain things that you see when you shine that light at a certain corner of the attic, let's say a certain corner of the larger energetic bubble that is you. So, so felt security is in fact the ability to turn that light on and theoretically we would have to say off if you want to, but also to shine it around and to be able to acknowledge what it is that you're looking at. And usually how you are feeling tells you what to look at and when. And when we stop listening to how we are feeling, we lose our ability to turn that flashlight on and off, okay? And so tapping into the body and its felt experiences is essentially tapping into spirit. That is how your soul, your spirit, your essence speaks to you. And it is where you are going to find the agency that you may be lacking after acquiring a certain level of insight and you hit a wall, because you will. Unless you are activating the body, you are gonna hit a wall with your insight and you're gonna be like thinking yourself in circles, right? And this all started because I wanted to come back to another story I had. When I came back from Mexico, I wanted to keep my heart open so I did start dating a few people and I met someone that I enjoyed immensely. Um, and he was, I mean, to a T, the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, like the quintessential archetype of men that I normally, usually, and in the past have always dated. And um, just, it was so bizarre that I was like, wow, like had this heart opening and now someone comes into my life who is like my quintessential, like ideal everything. And, and I realized as, as the, we dated for maybe six weeks and as that was evolving, um, he in the last week started taking a lot of distance. And then I thought he'd ghosted me again. And then I thought, oh, this is my fault because I'm, I'm writing video scripts about ghosting. I'm paying too much attention to it. And now it's happening. <laughs> But then he texted, he did text me after like a week, which was unusual. And he said, you know, I'm not going to ghost you. I just want you to know I'm sick. I'm working late and this and that. And it was kind of all these excuses. And then finally um, it came out that he was worrying about if the relationship would work. Were there these logistics? Because um, he lives in Brooklyn and I live in Manhattan. And there were so many logistics in terms of the commute that he thought that he'd be fighting logistics the whole time. And of course, I'm like, dude. I was just willing to date someone in Mexico. So this is clearly not something that I view as an impediment to a budding relationship. <laughs> so it just became clear that there were these, you know, there were these uh, values that were not lining up. There were, he kind of would like express something and then cut it off and express something and cut it off. And he, he couldn't open up to the possibilities. It's kind of like if the love of your life lived in Manhattan and you lived in Brooklyn, you wouldn't make the effort to pursue that? And how do you know that that's not what I am? You know? So it's, 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 it's needing to kind of, it's that story, right? It's that story we keep telling ourselves that kind of boxes us in. And he shared that, you know, and I, and I thought, and I, I actually, when he, I, first of all, I was very grateful that he didn't, he didn't just fall off the map. So I was able, I actually thought that was probably what was going on anyway, but it's nice to have the validation, right? And I thought about it and I digested it and I actually had to go to a funeral this weekend, which of course, anytime you go to something like a funeral puts everything in perspective, right? And I realized that, um, that it, what was being reflected back to me, because I do believe that everything you attract is somehow a reflection of your internal landscape. And our habit is to judge the external as bad. And so then we think there's something bad with us, but that that's not true. And so I, you reframe that story to whatever ex I'm experiencing in my external environment is actually a contrast that is intended to aid me in some fashion. So I realized that all of the, 
mechanisms that I use to experience a sense of felt security, which I do feel right now. And the things that I have done in my business, for example, which is going very well and has grown exponentially in three years, all of the things I know how to do and process for those things, I have not applied in my love life. <laughs> not really. I love talking about it. I like knowing how to do these things. I've manifested so many things about it. And it's ironic because I do attract wonderful people. I can't say I've ever had a bad date, but there's something in me there's something in me for as much as I know about it that's still a little bit like, yeah, not so sure I want it. Not so sure I want it. And I don't think that's an avoidant thing. I think it's actually like, what do I want my life to be? And and being focused and, and assured of who I am and what that is and being able to shine that light in the attic and talk to whoever's showing up in that beam at the right place in the right time. And I realized this past weekend, actually, that I haven't been in the place and time that I've wanted to be for that to happen until right now. <laughs> so it's interesting. I had this whole pivot. And all once I made that, once I had that realization, I was on a train ride from Boston to New York. And once I made that realization, it was like all these inklings started, I shouldn't say coming to me, but maybe coming out, you know, that they were they were uh, revealed, let's say. And I had all these ideas about things I could do to meet new people and get involved in communities that I have always fantasized about getting involved with, but haven't made the effort, you know? And, and suddenly I had all this motivation to do those things. And it wasn't necessarily all like romantic partner focused, but it was like, but I might actually now be willing to put myself in the vicinity of things that I haven't given myself permission to do before. And if love evolves out of it, I'm, I am much more of an open mind to welcome that in, you know? So um, the point is that I guess I'm trying to share a couple of things. And that is that it, when you are able to write the story in such a way where you eliminate judgment, right? When you are able to, Number one, realize that things in life are a reflection of what's going on inside and not to take that in as a judgment, right? Because if you're me like, oh, well, that must mean I'm doing terrible because my life is terrible, then that's a story you're writing. And that's a story that's going to start cutting off the possibilities for you, right? Instead, I am recommending that you do a reframe in the way that we have reframed these five myths about ghosting so that you can start to allow for those inklings to emerge so that you can pivot so that you can be like, actually, is this a decision that I am making on an unconscious level? And I'm telling myself that I'm not because it doesn't suit an egoic paradigm of what I think I should be doing. Right. And that means that you have to be in constant dialogue with the inner self as well as the outer self. And we don't prioritize the inner experience. I mean, not even a fraction of how much we prioritize the external experience. Right. So I believe that for, and that, how do you get in touch with the internal experience? Well, this is what we talk about in my method with cognitive reframing, body activation, and our space experiential. So cognitive reframing is about insight. It's about consciousness raising. It's about rewriting the stories in the way that we're doing it now. It's about identifying your fears and the wants you have as a result of the fears, and then realizing the deeper desire on the backside of that fear, which is probably something completely different than what you think you want, right? That whole Rolling Stone, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need, right? And and so, you know, so there's that. And then how are you going to eliminate judgment from your stories? How can you rewrite the story so that this could potentially be the best thing that ever happened to you, right? Like turning rejection into protection, that kind of thing. And then also letting yourself kind of sink into yourself. Like, Treating yourself with compassion. Um, there was another question that popped up with a story I did recently. And it was like, well, what if I don't have everything all together? What if my business isn't going well? What if I don't like my job? What if I just moved back in with my parents? What if um, not everything is the way that I want it right now? Does that mean that I'm not perfect enough? Does that mean that if everything isn't as it should be right now, that I have to wait until it's perfect and great before I can attract the perfect ideal partner? And I wanna say no. That's not the point. It's not whether your life is perfect or ever you have all your ducks lined up in a row right now. It's about your relationship to how you handle not having your ducks all lined up in a row. Is that okay? Is it okay for your ducks not to be lined up in a row? Is it okay? Is it okay to accept that that's just part of life's process? 
That's just part of your process. That's just that's just you sinking into and enjoying the conflicts and the contrast that you have been given in this life because as you engage and butt up against each and every one of them, you are learning about a new corner that you can expand into or a new character that is in your attic that wants to share a story with you, right? And 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 that you can be fluid in moving in and out of those corners and talking to these different characters at different times and different you know, ways in life that suit, that serve you. And, and isn't it such a wonderful sense of freedom to know that you don't have to be tied to any one of those stories ever, that you can write a new story at any point in time, that you can end a story and start a new one. You can have a thousand middle beginnings from that point between life and death. You can have a thousand middle beginnings if you want. Anything is possible, right? So, so, and as many pivot points as you want. So I think that is a good place to, to, to talk about. Um, I am getting to the end of, of my hour here, but I see we have a bit of feedback. Uh, so sort of meandered a little bit there, but it felt good. 